No mai hoki mai ki a dafold e mihi nei ko Duncan Grieve talking with uh, my guest today is Leon Wadham, who is an actor and director and is the director of Alice Nedden's Bad News, the, the special Saves the World, which is out now on the spin-off and, and you can find it on YouTube. <laughs> T.I. here, uh, the spin-off's podcast manager, and I have a, a running joke about my previous, I think I'm semi-reformed habit of saying, you know, that's it's another great week on the the fold, and uh, they can't all be great weeks. This one really is. I this is one of my favourite episodes. Uh, Leon is a person who, you know, I'll just quickly top line his career. He's he's a theatre kid. He's he was on TV from a you know before he was a teenager, and then went to Toy uh, Has you know has a real you know, background in in both acting and directing. He was on Go Girls. Uh, he's done a bunch of uh, stage acting, but then also, uh, you know, and, and had roles on like The Bad Seed and and in film. But then directed uh, Golden Boy and and has directed uh, Alice Nedden's Bad News from the start. And so, because we have been the uh, production house through through uh, Hexwork Productions and and the spin off as a platform platform for that show for years now we've just sort of been around one another and whenever I've spoken to him I've always just been just so impressed with him as a person the the brain on him how articulate he is how considered and um, curious and just just an absolute gem of a guy and that's all in this conversation he. He's incredibly thoughtful, really open, really reflective, and that goes for both the the, the, the two crafts, the the people that he's worked with, the operating environment for for television, the various platforms um, associated with it, and oh, I didn't mention, but dudes in Lord of the Rings, only the the biggest and and priciest television show in history, uh, and we we speak about that as well. Um, there's not a lot more to say. This is just uh, if you're remotely interested in any part of that world, um, and you know, in, in in bad news as a product, which is probably our most popular uh, video production and one of the things that we're best known for, and I'm probably most proud of in terms of the spin-off um, and what makes Alice Sneddon tick as a person. Uh, that's all in here. This is a really really good one. I think this is uh, Leon Wadham on the fold. Tenakwe, Leon, welcome to The Fold. Thanks for having me. I wonder if you could just start by telling me how this this business of ours, the, the, the media industry first caught your eye. Were you a theatre kid? Were you a pop culture fiend? All of the above. Just tell me how you started to dream on all this. All of the above. I think uh, when I was a kid, I was in like a bunch of choirs and then choirs led to musicals and then musicals led to like plays and then I was trapped in the theatre. Um, but you know, I was always watching everything I could and, um, I, I guess didn't stop. I'm still here. Did you sort of draw a distinction between the sort of high art of, of theater and musicals and, and the, the sort of lowbrow world of, of t- TV? Uh, I don't know that I did. I kind of liked everything. I mean, I, I like a lot of things that people would dismiss as pretentious for sure, um, but I also love my popcorn entertainment, and that's never um, stopped. I think there's value in everything. It's more just, is this a good version of what you were trying to do? That's what I'm always considering. It's a great, that's a great marker. Because we're recording this uh, the day after, less less than 24 hours uh, since the news broke about News Hub, but but also. And I think this has probably been underplayed a little. This has a huge impact on on three, and then and, and all the production houses and and uh, non news talent that that works there in various capacities. Uh, I wondered if you could kind of give some thoughts about or, or recollections about about growing up watching the channel and and whatever interactions you've had uh, with it over the years. I mean, I was a huge Outrageous Fortune fan, obviously. So three has always loomed large in terms of, I suppose, original content and the sort of the sense that, um, you know, as you were talking yesterday on the monopod, there was 
the government channels. And then there was this sort of like wild loose cannon thingy to the side that would bring you stuff you weren't expecting necessarily. And sometimes it felt like I had a rougher edge and that was exciting. And, um, you know, when I moved to Auckland, I was doing little bits and pieces with um, Bron and Cam. I was doing little bits on John and Ben and then Funny Girls. And then um, the first thing I directed for broadcast was Golden Boy, um, which ran for two seasons at three. And to be part of that world for a while was so thrilling. So the idea that that world is crumbling is obviously heartbreaking. Have you spoken with other people who are in a similar position to you, you know, uh, over the last 24 hours? What, what is the, the vibe like if you've got any sense of it amongst that community? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I guess we should have seen this coming. My dad was um, asking me over and over every couple of weeks last year about the project ending and what that meant. And um, I gave him my version of, you know, what I thought was happening. But I, I'd kind of convinced myself that it wouldn't be any more than that. But I suppose that was just wishful thinking. I mean, he texted me again last night and I don't know how to begin to unpack this or what the future of that network will look like. I kind of don't want to face it yet. I mean, where did you end up yesterday? You recorded the saddest pod in the world and then um, I assume kept thinking about it. Yeah, and, and kept talking to people about it sort of both on the record and off. I suppose I... I I had had a, a bad feeling like something was going to come, had been trying to sort of stand it up. But as is typical with stories like that, you you don't know until everyone knows and, and the information is very tightly held. So it, it wasn't, a, it was a shock, but not a surprise, mm. I think is the phrase that people use. Um, and I think that applies here. But I, I, because I've been so in the news cycle of it, I don't think I've really absorbed the sort of broader cultural ramifications yet and and I think when I do sort of exhale on it thinking about both the news and the entertainment aspects of the business that's the thing that's going to really sting because as, as you just put it so well there was this kind of roguish mm. quality to them that 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 TVNZ for all its myriad brilliant things it does it it doesn't surprise you so frequently mm. uh, as as three did, and I think the the country really needs that. Um, so yeah, it's 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 definitely heavy in the air. Um, I'm not actually sure where this aired to to kind of bring us back to to track, but uh, the first sort of exposure you had that I'm aware of to to TV in terms of making it was the tribe, which. <laughs> It's, there's a lot of people who who had their a little dalliance or, or or potentially more with that show. It was incredibly groundbreaking and and you know lingers in people's memories. Uh, can you tell me about your experience uh, there? Yeah, I had a, a fleeting run on the tribe. I was um, in an after school like drama class with. Hera Lindsay Bird with uh, Eli Kent with a bunch of people who've gone on to uh, make big waves in this industry. We were all about like 10 or 11. And one of our tutors there was working on the show, Lindy Jane Rutherford. And um, I think she just went like, I've got some people who can um, help solve some problems. <laughs> and so we were slotted in. The first thing I remember... Do you want to quickly explain what, what the tribe was for anyone listening who maybe wasn't aware I mean, do, of it? Do I remember what it was? I was so young. It it it, it was like this um, fantasy series about a world where a pandemic had wiped out all adults. And so it was um, just kids sort of running this, um, I think they all lived in like a, an abandoned mall. And um, Antonia Preble was one of the leads. I, I, I think it ran for about six seasons and it was massive in Europe. And here it was relegated to, you know, like 1 p.m. on a Sunday. Like you really had to search it out. But it was massive. I remember they um, were traveling around doing signings all the time. I remember there was like a – I saw a music video once that they'd done. And they went like, what if some of these people could be um, – Pop stars, worth a go. Worth a go. I love that era where, where that kind of thing was, was plausible. Anyway, that, that's a really great summary, and I, but I have again derailed you. Do, do you want to punch back to your sort of the way you were sliding in? That, that, that's it, really. I just um, came in a few times to uh, solve problems on that show. I think I played like three different people. <laughs> you know, just drop in for an episode and then come back out again. And yeah, I must have been about 11 at the time. I did something an Ivanhoe show called Dark Knight around the same era. I don't know which came first, 
But that was with, you know, when I say Des Kelly and Helen Mulder and a bunch of those people around the same time. So one of those two things was the first thing I did on TV as an actor. But clearly it, you know, didn't repel you. No. Do, do you re- recall sort of enjoying the, yeah. the scale and scope of it? Oh, I loved it. I love I love a job where everyone um, sits down and eats together in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, but because of, so you were born in 89, is that right? Yep. So you are a teenager during that decade where the internet really becomes a thing, becomes this sort of force that impacts culture in quite a profound way. How online were you as a kid and, and were you kind of paying attention to, to that or were you still sort of in the old world? Oh, I was pretty online. I'm still, um, for better or worse, very online. I looked back at some of the stuff I was watching the other day and it doesn't all hold up, but it was exciting that it was uh, possible to make stuff relatively inexpensively and share it with the world. Some of those early YouTube videos are bad, you know, they're shocking. But it was just exciting that people seem to have bypassed gatekeepers completely and just gone, here's what I've got for you. And um, a lot of those people have stuck around, I suppose. We were watching some almost sunny the other day, those really early episodes. I think the pilot is still floating around somewhere. And um, that wasn't necessarily like a web show, but it felt like it was born of that energy of people going, well, we could just do it ourselves if we want it and see if anyone's interested. Has that, you, you feel like, when, when I sort of assess your career, this isn't entirely true, but you, if you have a foot in both the kind of DIY versus the, uh, you know, like a more traditional camp, you're probably slightly overweighted onto the, the, that more traditional end. Is that fair to say? Don't know anymore. I um, haven't uh, kept track. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but certainly in terms of, you know, you, you come out of school, you go to Toifukari and and then, well, you tell me about about your sort of, your first in- entries into, into TV and whether it was a role or an experience that made you go, actually, I'm just going to give this everything and, and make try and make a home and a career here. When I left high school, I went to Vic for a bit and kind of just did everything and I kept leaving to do theatre or, um, you know, I, the first year I started toy, I got glandular the fever and found out I had been cast in a movie on the same day. And that means I could um, go to bed for four months and then do that movie. And um, I eventually went back to toy and went, okay, this is what I'm doing. I think it was, yeah, a year at Vic, um, intended to go to toy, got sick, went the following year and saw it through. And by then I was pretty clear that um, despite having tried to do like a a history degree or something, I was always going to be lured back to this other world. So my logic was, why don't I just try and get as good at it as possible? And toys and incubator seemed like a good idea. And my good fortunate toy was that um, there was a strong emphasis at that time on making. And so a lot of the stuff that I really um, gained from that three-year period was a sense of how to develop work. And that wasn't necessarily what I'd gone there for, but it's probably the thing that I left with that has kept me afloat all this time. Also, in addition to these amazing tutors, I had amazing classmates. So um, Chris Parker and Haley Sproul and I were all in the same class. We were making stuff together throughout um, our three years there. And afterward, we've um, fed into one another's projects since school. But when I first came out of Toy, I was in this happens kind of every year, as far as I can tell. Someone looks young enough to play the teenage son in whatever is going at the mainstream theatre company or whatever. So I got to do stuff at Silo, I got to do stuff at ATC, and I got cast in the um, final season of Go Girls. And um, I had this amazing run in the machine <laughs> as kind of a young enough looking person. And then when I got a little too old to do that, it wasn't possible to depend on other people to give me things to do anymore. And that's when I started returning to making my stuff more of the time. And I think when I look at how I spent the last five years, it's been a pretty even split. There have been times when it's been, you know, all directing or making work and then all acting work. But I think in the last, yeah, since the pandemic, it's been 50-50, I'd say. I really want to sort of dig into that, but before we kind of move on from that period, I, I'd love to get your sense of, you know, you, you had one season of, Go, of uh, Go Girls, which was at the time, like, I feel like we we forget about that show, but it was it was pretty huge during a time when 
a huge show it was was really really big in terms of like I'm I'm I haven't looked up its ratings but I would guess that they would make it one of the biggest shows on TV bar none right mm. now. What was it like to to drop into a machine like that during was it fifth or sixth season? Yeah, their fifth season. I mean, it was wonderful for us as actors because it was such a well-oiled machine. Like everyone making that show really knew how to make the show. So um, you know, sometimes on like a new thing, a new play, a new um, TV series, everyone's trying to work out what it is and you might spend the first year trying to figure out how to do it well. That wasn't an issue for us, so we just got to perform it. And um, it was a fantastic job. I loved doing that job. And as you say, the ratings had been really good. They had designed that show um, in the first couple of years as... I guess like a glossy product that could slot into 8.30 p.m. on TV2 and not look at odds with the American stuff that was either side of it. And they'd pull it off. When we were coming on, it was, and I can't remember if I got the dates right, but I think our season aired in like 2013, maybe? That sounds right. And I feel like you're a person who would have checked Throng a lot. Throng was available to us, and Throng was definitely saying, look at how well this had rated and look at where it's rating now. But as we saw for years after that with other shows in that ilk, everything was starting to slide as the streamers started to come up. So 2013 would have been, yeah, the, the early streaming yeah. uh, services were really starting to kind of, every six months a new one launched. Yeah, and so that was definitely cannibalizing the audience, no question. It's not your fault. Is what you're saying. Well, maybe. <laughs> I would say that, yeah, there were other factors in play, but we were really proud of the work we were doing there and really happy to be doing it. Now, I was doing that with um, Ty Bird and the Blades, who was, uh, again, the year behind me at Toy and still, you know, one of the best we've got. Uh, Shara Connolly, who'd been on the show previously and was fantastic to be in a scene with. She, she was incapable of being bad. You'd sometimes, like, run your lines goofily just to see if they were there, and um, she would try and be goofy and then would just become incredible. She couldn't help herself. And then J.J. Fong, who's obviously become a powerhouse in this industry, and George Mason, who was in my class at Toy as well and left early to go to, I think, the Blue Rose and then went on to Home and Away and a bunch of other stuff. So um, it was a really exciting time to be learning to make TV around other people who were in a pretty good spot who knew what they were doing. So just before we kind of get into the the directing and the more sort of DIY type world, uh, there's this quite a large show that you're currently a part of. H how did, did Lord of the Rings happen for you? And there's Go Girls, pretty big show, and then there's the, the biggest, most lavishly funded show in the history of television. What what What... Yeah, how did you come in and what changes when you're working at the kind of infinity scale and budget of, of Lord of the Rings? Uh, so I auditioned for Lord of the Rings right as we were going into level four for the first time in New Zealand. So I was doing a tape um, in my bedroom. I'd moved the bed. I had my phone held up by the retractable bit on a tape measure, on a chopping board, on a ladder from out the back. And the guy who was subletting Alice Sneddon's room, who'd gone to do Starstruck season one and come back two weeks later and couldn't get her room back, uh, was reading in for me. And um, it was kind of like the world's ending, so why not? You know, just sort of send it away. And then six months later, they said, could you come in tomorrow? I'm pretty sure. And um, I had a new version of that scene to do and a new scene. And I went in and then two weeks later, they uh, offered me the job. And that was shooting out west, that was shooting here. And they were a good way through. I don't think they started shooting the Numenor stuff, which is what I do, until the second half because they built, uh, you know, an incredible, <laughs> this incredible set. It was, you know, blocks upon blocks of this city and that had taken some time, basically. So they were doing all of the stuff uh, in the forests, in the mud, the things that already existed while they were building this staggering thing for us to act in. And then, you know, I, I think, I can't remember when it happened, they must have been trying to decide what they were going to do about the borders. And in that conversation, where we couldn't decide if it was going to be possible to get people in and out of the country. They decided to move production to London. But um, it wasn't something I'd seen coming. I grew up in Wellington. Um, I think I was in primary school when they were making the original trilogy. And then I was at drama school when they were making the Hobbit trilogy. And it had never occurred to me that there would be uh, part for me in there because I can't ride a horse. 
Um, <laughs> and then uh, the part I got makes complete sense for terrible reasons. Um, and I also think that a lot of the directing stuff I've been doing for the past decade or whatever, because the character is kind of a political operator in many ways, kind of worked, kind of um, slotted neatly inside of the other parts of that role. So, um, yeah, it, it, it came out of left field, but it, it does make sense. The person who cast me in that, Stu Turner, he cast me in that um, movie I did when I was 18, which paid for me to go to drama school. So there is a lineage there as well of, um, you know, you you do a job and then you may not get one with that same person for quite a long while. But, um, you know, they, they might remember you. Maybe they'll go, I think I've got the guy for this one. And I'm glad that he thought that guy was me. Um, interesting that that comment you made just there about the the political operator thing and, and and that being part of the director's role. I've not heard that before, but I'd love you to expand on that as as we sort of segue into talking about um, your role as a director. Mm. Well, I mean, I, hmm, directing is kind of just like management of ideas, right? It's about going. I think the best version of this is X. And so I'm going to try and bring everyone toward X. And some people might bring you a bunch of Y and Z and you have to go, thank you, but we're going to do X. Um, and sometimes their ideas might be better than what you've got, but they might not fit. And sometimes they're so good that you go, okay, I'm going to change what I'm doing and we're all going to do Y. I think that took me a while to work out. I remember at Toy in the second year, you do a devised project. And I was so frustrated with the directors and that thing because I felt they were holding things back from us. Um, I was like, why don't you just tell us what's going on so we can make good decisions here? I feel like you're trying to like leak out information slowly out of fear that I'm going to go rogue. And they said, well, at times an actor's job is not to know everything. At times your job is just to focus on um, your particular part of the puzzle. And I think they were right. Sometimes you've got to go, these people in these positions, actors or technicians or whoever, um, have to be focused on their specific area because the thing is too big. We can't all be solving everyone's problem. And um Often your job as a director is going like, okay, are all the plates still spinning? What's going fine and what uh, needs some support? That's my take. That's a pretty good take. Do you, you, you know, right now, you, as you said, there's a, there's a foot in either camp. Do you, do you see that directing, you know, will ultimately win out over acting? Like, do, does it feel like, what, where do you feel most at home in terms of the, this, that, that side of the industry? I enjoy it all. I mean, the thing I got out of directing that I, when I talk about that frustration on that second year project, for example, it was me going, if I had a space where I could scratch that itch, maybe I wouldn't feel that itch when I was just working as an actor. And that has been my experience that um, because I'm not responsible for something that can be quite freeing. And then I can go, now I am responsible for this one. And um, it it's just a, a different way. It's A change is as good as a rest, you know? But the thing I wanted to do and what I've been trying to do is only stuff I like, only good things. <laughs> and um, the more I move between, you know, directing or acting or writing or dramaturgical or, you know, script assessment opportunities, the more I can say these are the ones um, that are exciting to me right now or that I think I could contribute to or that I have a vision for that I think would be yeah worth sharing. And if I can keep that up, I'll be happy. So we we we're, we're here or the the spur for this is is the fact that we have just I think we're again a couple of hours away from releasing the second part of uh, the most recent um and most ambitious in terms of a single subject in some respect scope uh, Alice Nedden's bad news um saves the world not not a small thing um but I wonder if you could just start by telling me about when you first came into contact with with Alice, whether it was you know, meeting her, seeing her perform, and and just give a sense of what it was about her that that seemed interesting to you, um, I met Alice when she was still a law student. So I knew she was special. I knew she was hilarious. Her brother is a brilliant actor, Sam Sneddon, but she wasn't performing at that time. She wasn't writing at that time. She was a huge comedy fan. You know, we were both. Um, and still are massive 30 Rock fans. But it wasn't until maybe two or three years into our friendship that she kind of um, came into this part of the world. And um, I can't remember what the first thing. I remember that she 
was going to do the raw comedy quest or something. She was going to do some stand up, and um, she ran through her set with me at uh, the Hamilton Road Beach. And when she did that first gig, she did it with her eyes closed. Um, she was wow. so funny, but she was um, so petrified. And the first couple of times I saw her, she was still kind of like leaning back, barely. Um, you know, it was a squint, if anything. She was not connecting. And this thing that Alice has that makes her such a powerhouse is that she has this um, staggering confidence. This is the thing that, like, like that, that, so isn't that baffling to think about now? Yes. That she was um, because of what she radiates. Absolutely. And I think. Uh, she has come into her power, obviously, in um, the time since, where she is um, so intimidating. And the thing that we kind of weaponized with the first season of Bad News was, you know, she's a lawyer. She's incredibly switched on. She's um, such a brilliant um, conversationalist and agitator and um, can sort of hold her own with anybody. But we would kind of bring her into the fold um looking like she just rolled out of bed so people wouldn't take her seriously. And as the show's gone on, um, that's not been possible because she's, you know, her reputation precedes her. But there are very few people that can be um, that sharp and interrogative but also have this, you know, incredible emotional availability. You know, you you can see what she's thinking, what she's feeling written on her face. She'd be an amazing actor if she wanted to be one just because she can't hide anything. So um, these debates, when the passion comes out, it's undeniable. And she is just, on top of that, hilarious. So when you've got all of those three things together, it felt like it was hard to lose. So when the show came together, I think it was when Amy Mills was still at TVNZ. We did a pilot. It was around that new blood time. I'd done some stuff there with um, Gareth Williams and Tim Batt kind of running things. And Kate Simmons as well was working with Amy. We did a first episode of Bad News. It was the one with Rose Matafio and Christine Rankin about um, tax evasion. And on the back of that, they gave us permission to do, I think, nine more, eight more, something like that. And um, we've been doing it every couple of years ever since. It's, it's, you know, one of the great joys of my life, making the show with her. What In terms of the show, you know, versus A Golden Boy or, or, or some of the other work you've directed, it... It's got some really different properties. It's it's operating in a place where you're going up against public figures. You're dealing with the factual realm rather than the you know uh, the scripted. What have you found sort of challenging? And you know, you just said it's a, a great joy about it in terms of because it is quite differentiated from the ground you typically operate in. Mm. The challenge is that it is unscripted. So I think for this special, we ended up with 12 hours of interview content to turn into two 20-minute episodes and trying to distill the ideas down to something that is representative of the conversations we've had and, you know, the most interesting ideas with also going, what journey can we craft that people can follow? Because obviously this topic is huge. And um, one of the difficulties with climate change uh, materials that people don't necessarily want to watch it. So you're balancing this thing of, okay, how do we ensure that we are entertaining while also contributing something valuable to this conversation? That's for me the biggest challenge. And I'm so lucky to have Alexander Gander on this because he is, you know, obviously he did a hundred year forecast here, but a brilliant editor and a brilliant person to kind of bat ideas back and forth with. I think as far as the tone goes, there's a lot of stuff in the language that is, um, set in a way that is helpful. So, you know, the, the rules are quite straightforward for the show. Alice sits on the left. Every interview is on sticks. If we're out in the world, that is handheld. It's little things that um make, to my mind, it as easy as possible for people to follow that conversation, even if the uh, ideas get thick and dense and fast. <laughs> I just try and go, how streamlined a viewing experience can we make it? And how simple can we make some of those things versus a narrative thing where because you know the parameters, you can be flashier if you want to be. I think for this show, it's important to be invisibly stylish. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to distract people unnecessarily from the idea. That, that's true, but you also don't want to to lose people. I think one of the things that's most impressive about it is the way that it can kind of flash around these different scenes and setups in a way that functions as a a kind of punctuation or allows you to take a breath from a. Yeah, you know, there are some real oof, 
type type moments, but they're they're punctured with this, you know, the, this kind of comic absurdist uh, element. How did you kind of go about getting and maintaining that balance and having the confidence that you weren't just making something that was purely funny about this thing, which is you know, you're, you, you is very deliberately chosen as a topic. Mm. Um, I kind of, well, I mean, part of the design of bad news is that you always have a comedian. You always have somebody who will be reliably funny. And then you've got Alice who is funny. So, um, I try to go, that will be taken care of. Don't worry about that so much. Focus on just letting the ideas, the, um, conversation flow naturally through the episode. And I suppose, I mean, the logic of putting Alice on the left every time is that it should feel like it's one conversation, but you just keep swapping out the person on the right. So as much as you might not notice it necessarily, sometimes it's in terms of the topic, sometimes it's in terms of the um, energy or the, uh, I suppose, underlying um, emotion or the the thing where we're moving toward, even if we haven't named it yet, we try and keep that uh, a logical progression so that the audience is never going like, well, why are we going here? And then the pressure relief thing of the comedy is just when you get to a point where you go, okay, we need a reset. We need um, to give people a breath. You cut to Rose and she'll say something ridiculous and that'll be, that'll work a treat. <laughs> um, not to to make it all about uh, the spinoff or Hexwork Productions, but sometimes I feel like I can always be too coy about the, the, our, our role when we make these things. But, you know, you've, you've had that experience at with the show at TVNZ, making shows for bigger networks. What's different when you're working with a, a much smaller production company and, and platform, uh, you know, I, either way in terms of how it's constructed and distributed? That's a great question. I mean, when we were doing it at TVNZ, it was kind of a smaller version of the show. We'd go, we'd have a comedian, we'll have an expert, and we'll have a public figure. And um, that would be the conversation. And when we came to spin off, um, when we came to Hex Work, who really believe in the show who really um, wanted to support us to make the best version of it. We started, you know, getting more and more and more interview subjects. We started getting more and more and more time in the edits. We started getting more and more and more, I suppose, genius <laughs> uh, feeding into the process um, with Isaiah Tour, with um, Jen Fallot, with Sophie Dawson, with Amber Easby, with yourself. We have had a lot more cooks in a good way in this kitchen saying, how do we make this the best possible version of the show? I mean, we had so many interviews for this climate change special that we couldn't use them all. And in the TVNZ version of that, because it was, uh, you know, a funded in-house production, because it was a smaller scale thing, we just had less to choose from. Whereas here we had so much to choose from that it became agonizing. And that I think would be the marked difference between the early days and the late days. We've just we know what we're doing, but we keep um, pushing ourselves further and further and further to make the best possible version of this thing. Oh, that's that's beautiful and, and very very sweet of you to say. Do you do do you feel like we've had enough bad news, or do you you know has moving up into this kind of bigger, rangier realm kind of given you and Alice a sense that that maybe there's, there's more that can be done, whether it's with that combination or, or um, you know, with this with this format. Alice and I have worked together a lot, and I love working with her. We're making something at the moment, but in terms of bad news itself, I think after the third season, which I think was released as the final season, Alice, because she's back and forth a lot to London, because we were getting older, and she was going, "Are we sure we can still make the show when?" Um, we can see the complexity and everything when we're no longer righteous 25 year olds. Are we still delivering on the promise of this thing? Should we give it to someone younger and angrier? I think she really did believe that maybe we should think about um, throwing in the towel and having made the special, I, I completely disagree. <laughs> I would happily do this forever because I think the version of ourselves we bring to it in every season is a valid version. I think we do get better at making the show. And I think the murkier aspects of it. I mean, the Don Brash thing will loom large forever. There's nothing we can do about that. But um, the conversations we have where we expect to kind of win, to defeat some big baddie and come out kind of more, I don't know, thoughtful or more conflicted or more kind of challenged by someone else's way of looking at the world, I think are really interesting and really valuable. So part of me goes, yeah, maybe we should think about a version that takes a different format just for the exercise of it, what would the 
long form series look like? What would the documentary, the feature length documentary look like? But in terms of um, bad news itself, I, I think that thing can shift and change with us. And I'm curious to see if and when the next evolution arrives. I love to hear you say that, every aspect of it, because it's, you know, for, for me, who's always been, for better or worse, a, a person who feels like things are a lot more complicated than we can make them out. And there are huge forces in our society and communication infrastructure now that that push you towards saying it's either this or it's mm. that and it's not in between. And that's been such a joy for me to, to watch the show evolve, to be comfortable sitting in that space, it doesn't duck its kind of moral force. It's still really funny, but it... It feels like it runs con contra some of the, the sort of these sort of streams as a result. Uh, so, you know, personally, uh, would love to see, to see you keep keep uh, keep working on it and, and and seeing where it would evolve. We're almost out of time here. We somewhat unbelievably have to make way for Adrian or the governor of the Reserve Bank. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a strange world we live in. But um, I, I wanted to kind of return to, to you for a final question about, I guess, where you see your career going. You've got a good thing happening with, with Lord of the Rings um, and and some amazing kind of creative relationships. But, but yeah, I wondered if you could kind of give a nod to, to what you might look back at, you know, in, in the future. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day because... I don't know the answer at the moment. I mean, obviously, as we talked about at the beginning of this interview, it's a shifting landscape. I don't know if you listen to the town that Matt Baloney. Um, I do. I do have occasion to. It's a, I, well, actually, that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. Like, how much do you pay attention to, to the business of of this business? Because it has such an impact on the creative side. But sometimes you can meet creatives who are almost oblivious to mm. it. I think I am too aware of it uh, to my detriment because I kind of at times go. But what, why? <laughs> you know, who knows where you'll get to in a process before um, the whole thing um, topples. But I just want to keep making good things. And I think my current uh, ambition is to do a better job at, I suppose, seeking those things out, trying to create those things, trying to make sure that they uh, – that I'm making them exist when other things that I can't control may disappear, you know? So as, as the sands are shifting, go, okay, so what, what can I control? <laughs> what um, can I put into being that I think is valuable to share? And um, that's not something I've necessarily been great at. So when you talk about, are you aware of it? Yes, I'm aware of it. And yet I don't do enough um, in the face of that. And that's the thing I'm trying to solve at the moment. Well, I look forward to, to seeing what comes of that and have, yeah, you know, it's been great working with you, but I've really, really loved this this conversation about that, that, that sort of candor and thoughtfulness. Uh, so good to have you on the fold, Leon. Thank you for having me. <laughs>